Greetings, sisters and brothers. Welcome to African History Club, episode number 55. I'm your host, Milton Alimadi. Thank you for all your support. Today, I want to focus on the manufactured food crises in Africa. Of course, it's a real crisis, but at the same time, it's manufactured basically because of Africa's location, dependent location in the global economic system and the international division of labor, with Africa operating essentially as a plantation for the industrialized countries, providing raw materials, whether it's agricultural production, whether it's minerals, whether it's other natural resources from Africa, to satisfy the industrial needs of the Western countries, and now increasingly China as well. So let's get straight into it. The Food and Agricultural Organization estimates that the index that measures food inflation went up by 12% between March and April. And that, in some parts of the world, including West Africa, that figure is more likely closer to 20%. 26 million people already face hunger in West African countries, millions more in other parts of the continent. That figure in West Africa alone is estimated by the Food and Agricultural Organization to reach 30 million in June. This is very, very troublesome. But at the same time, even with all these grim estimates, African countries are still producing what is called cash crops because they've become so dependent on producing and exporting these crops for foreign exchange earnings, convertible currency earnings, that they cannot wean themselves off in a timely manner, even when people are facing hunger and starvation. And this is the legacy of the colonial regime and the colonial structure set on the economies during European colonial rule. So let's look at one example as a case study, and it's reflective of the experience of all the African countries that were colonized. And of course, the entire continent was colonized except for Ethiopia. And that was, of course, because Ethiopia defeated Italy in 1896 at the Great Battle of Adwa. Otherwise, the entire continent was colonized. So let's look at Mozambique. In Mozambique, the Portuguese forced Africans to produce cotton. The cotton was exported for textiles, for clothing, in metropolitan Portugal, and then shipped back for the Africans to purchase at greatly inflated prices. The Africans were compelled by slave labor and taxation to provide their labor. If they did not, they were either locked up or they were lashed, vicious lashing, just like the typical slave regime. What happened during crises? So let's look, let's look at the Great Depression. When the prices of global commodities collapsed during the Depression, suddenly the Africans had no money, suddenly the Africans could not buy the food that they'd become dependent on buying because they're producing cash crops. And they had not been allowed to grow their own food. So the famine killed tens of thousands of Africans. Cotton was called the mother of hunger and the mother of famine in Mozambique. So you can replicate this throughout the colonial empire in Africa whether it was a British colony, French colony, whether it was Belgium, whether it was Spain, Italy, Germany, they all had the same similar pattern. In some French colonies, Africans were even banned from producing certain types of food crops because obviously that would make them dependent, independent. So they wanted them to be dependent, even for their existence, for their consumption. Because that's how you compel labor from people that used to own the land. So now you displace them. How do you compel them to come back to work for you? By setting up these structures. You ban certain types of production. 
you impose taxation, and you impose penalties for people who don't supply their labor to earn currency to pay those taxes. That was the structure. So now let's look at the contemporary era. Even as we speak right now, even as Africans are starving, let's look at a country like Uganda. Coffee. Coffee remains one of the highest income earners from exports. Number two, after tourism, ranging from six to seven hundred million dollars annually in import earnings. Even as Africans in Uganda are now complaining of high food prices. The production pattern, the production system continues to be the same structure that was set up during the colonial regime. In other words, these countries have no control over their production. They don't get to choose what they want to produce. They don't get to choose to produce to satisfy the needs of their own citizens, of their domestic population, because they serve essentially as plantations for the industrialized countries. And that is why I call it a manufactured crisis. So we have another global situation, another outside external situation, which is having global ramification, including on Africa. And that is the Russia-Ukraine war. Africa depends on 85% of its consumption of grain, barley and wheat from, imp from imports. And most of the imports comes from Russia and Ukraine for the wheat and barley. So the war has direct impact in disrupting that supply line. And then of course the war also by increasing the price of fuel elevates inflation generally by increasing the cost of transport. So that is having the ramification throughout the African economy. And all these countries have zero capacity for mitigating factor. It's not like they have abundant storage or supplies of food that can be released during conditions of crisis, such as the one they are currently experiencing. And this goes back to not being able to control their production. That was the case during colonialism, and that is the case today. So one could make the argument that colonialism has not ended in Africa. <laughs> and that's what we've actually been saying over the last several months in this series of podcasts. That's independence in name only, formal independence. Structure remains the same. So now what do we have? We have countries that are unable to feed their population. Of course, when a government cannot feed its citizens, that government does not deserve to remain in power. Contrast with the conditions in Burkina Faso when Thomas Sankara was in power. In Burkina Faso, after Thomas Sankara came to power in 1983, he said, if anybody wants evidence about imperialism, all you have to do is look at your plate. If your food, if the food that you consume is imported, that is imperialism. Within three years, Burkina Faso became food self-sufficient. Sankara knew the importance of that. Yet all these African countries have not been able to step out of that dependency model and insist that they must be able to feed their own citizens. Even as they unleash themselves from other structures of dependency, food self-sufficiency 
must be goal number one. Instead, Africa spends $35 billion annually on food imports. This is a continent that has much of the world's available arable land, available waters, available sunlight, and certainly available labor. But the economic structures are so disoriented and so dictated to by the World Bank and the IMF that they cannot change the production system even during conditions of crises, conditions of hunger, conditions of famine, and starvation. And in West Africa, the situation is much more compounded because of the ongoing drought in some parts of West Africa and the armed conflict in many of these countries. And of course, the armed conflict escalated after the United States and NATO destroyed Gaddafi's government in Libya. And all this arsenal of weapons that Gaddafi had now spread and became available to any militia group that had any grievance against their governments. So in Burkina Faso, which was once food self-sufficient, now you have millions of people that have been displaced from their farms. The country is now facing starvation as a result of this conflict. And then we also have conflict in Cameroon that's been raging for years because the French-speaking side under the dictator Paul Biya, supported by France, has unleashed war against the English-speaking south, southern part of the country. And of course, you won't hear about it in the corporate media, <laughs> because as far as the corporate media is concerned, the only ongoing conflict in the world is in Ukraine. And then we have the conflict in Tigray, with the current embargo imposed by the central government in Addis Ababa which has also caused starvation and reportedly hundreds of thousands may have already died as a result of this embargo. What is to be done? Unfortunately, many of these countries are going to sink deeper into the tentacles and clutches of the IMF and the World Bank. They will be given loans for emergency relief and increase to the debt burden that they've already incurred over the years. And that is, of course, a condition that is desirable for the IMF and World Bank and the West, deepening the dependency of African countries. If anybody wants any evidence about that being the case, all you have to do is look at the fate of Tomas Sankara. Tomas Sankara was tolerated, even though he was trying to remove Burkina Faso from the dependency system. He was tolerated until he denounced the foreign debt and called on other African countries to collectively renounce the debt at the Organization of African Unity meeting in 1987, and we've discussed this in the past podcast. And he said, if we don't do it collectively, and I do it individually on behalf of Burkina Faso, I will not be alive to attend next year's OAU conference. Three months later, in October 1987, he was assassinated. And the debt burden has cre increased and grown worse, particularly recently with the havoc caused by the COVID pandemic over Africa's economies. 
And now you compound it with the consequences of the Russia-Ukraine war. So that is the one side of it, the deepening of the dependency. But on the other side, you also have young people agitating in many of these African countries now, in West Africa, in South Africa, and in normally dormant countries such as Uganda, which has had this brutal military dictatorship under General Museveni for 36 years, supported by the United States, armed by the United States, trained by the United States, subsidized with $1 billion in annual U.S. taxpayer money. But hunger can do remarkable things. So for the first time, you have people defying this brutal government that in the past has unleashed bullets on people that come out to protest the political repression. But hunger is now bringing out more people to protest. And recently, when people complained about the high prices of food commodities, saying bread is now unaffordable, General Museveni said, eat cassava. <laughs> this is the level of elitism and somebody being completely out of touch. And of course, on social media, people excoriated him and compared his comments to the alleged comments attributed to Marie Antoinette. Let them eat cake. And people reminded him of the fate of Marie Antoinette and her husband, the king, Louis XVI. That is where things stand in African countries today as a result of the manufactured food crises coming out of their dependent economic structures, which of course the solution is to break these structures. And of course it comes with a penalty. Thomas Sankara was the best evidence that it comes with a penalty. Thomas Sankara used to like saying, let us consume what we produce and let us produce what we consume. And that was a very dangerous message to the industrialized countries that want to continue exploiting Africa, which of course the easiest way to do so is by maintaining neo-colonial leadership in African countries. So you liquidate a Patrice Lumumba, a Kwame Nkrumah, a Thomas Sankara, while you maintain in power people like Mobutu in the former Zaire, Congo, and General Museveni in Uganda. These are the ones that are in power for decades, the reactionary ones, the ones who wanted to take control over Africa's production and reorientate the economy to the needs of the population. Those are the ones who are eliminated because they're setting good examples for Africa. And those good examples translate into danger for those who want to continue exploiting Africa. On the other hand, these are the type of conditions that allowed a Thomas Sankara to emerge in Burkina Faso. And certainly, given the pressure coming from the youth in Africa, Africa is the youngest continent in the world, Perhaps these are the types of conditions that can inspire another Thomas Sankara. Other Thomas Sankaras, because there needs to be more than one at the same time. As Sankara observed at the 1987 Organization of African Unity meeting, if we stand together, we can succeed. 
because they cannot assassinate all the African presidents. If I stand alone, they will kill me. So we need many Thomas Sankaras emerging at the same time, making it impossible for all of them to be liquidated. So on that note, I end episode 55. I also want to make an announcement. Based on many comments by my students at John Jay College, where I teach African history, many people have contacted me and asked if I would be willing to teach a summer series. So I've decided to do so. I'm going to be having a series of 10 lectures beginning on June 11 until August 20th. So it'll be a weekly lecture of about an hour and a half via Zoom. So these will be live lectures on Saturdays at noon. Could you try again? Saturdays at noon, excuse me, that's my other computer acting up. Sorry for that. Sorry for that interruption. So the lectures would also include in-class discussions. The lecture itself would be for anywhere between 30 minutes to 45 minutes, and then the rest of the class time would be spent in discussions with me and the students and amongst all the students at the same time. So anybody can sign up for this lecture. I'm going to have a sliding fee for this lecture. I have uh, surveyed a number of people who contacted me and asked that I launch this series. So I have a range of people that were comfortable with $200 for the 10 lectures, uh, $250 and $300. So I will have a sliding scale. I want people to, uh, to be able to pay what they feel is reasonable and what they're comfortable with. So if you want more information about this lecture, the title is going to be Africa from Colonization, Resistance, Independence, and Neo-Colonialism. I've already developed the syllabus, so if you're interested in considering signing up and registering for this, contact me via email and I'll send you the information including the proposed syllabus. I, of course, will recommend my book, Manufacturing Hate, Our Africa Was Demonized in Western Media. And then I will have additional chapters, readings from various books, and I'll make those chapters available by email message uh, to people that decide to sign up for the series of 10 lectures. And my email address is malimadi at gmail.com so that I can send you the information. That's M-A-L-L-I-M-A-D-I. malimadi at gmail.com. You can also text me via 646-261-7566 with your email information. And I will also send you a copy of the proposed syllabus with some of the proposed readings. On that note, I close today's presentation. As always, I thank you for your support, and I look forward to interacting with you in the next podcast, and certainly welcome you if you decide to sign up for this series of 10 lectures. And if you have any questions regarding the lectures, you have my email information and you have the number where you can text me. Thank you, stay strong, remain Pan-African. See you soon.